All right, let's take our seats so we can get started, please. This morning, we're very pleased to have Dr. and Colonel Brian Eastridge here to speak to us about the uh, general surgeon's role in the management of pelvic fractures. Uh, Dr. Eastridge uh, graduated from Virginia Tech University, did his medical school and residency at the University of Maryland, a trauma critical care fellowship at Southwestern in Dallas, and stayed on staff there, uh, was awarded numerous teaching awards, uh, rose to some national prominence, and then for reasons that are unclear, I think even to him, uh, decided to join the Army. Uh, as a uh, as he served our country in the Army, he's been deployed numerous times to uh, uh, war zones and has served as the uh, chief of the Joint Theater Trauma uh, Management Team over there. Uh, he's also won numerous uh, military awards and has been on our faculty working with uh, our residents taking trauma call for uh, several years now. And we're very pleased to uh, announce that Dr. Eastridge will be joining our faculty full time uh, in the next year or so. And so we welcome Brian aboard and want to thank him for being here this morning. Thank Once you. I get a yeah. Dan, thanks for that introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to the to the to the group. Um, uh, I have uh, several uh, you know areas of interest, and one of the areas of interest that I picked up early on in my career was uh, was the management of pelvic fractures, particularly with the implications to the the general surgeon. So some of the things I'm going to talk about today are sort of the background, go over some basics on anatomy, some of the basics on how to evaluate the pelvis and some of the diagnostic techniques that we use to evaluate the pelvis uh, in, the situ in the injury situation, and then look more specifically at some of the acute management strategies, associated injuries, complications, and their, their attendant outcomes. Now, one thing to be aware of right up front is any time you have a patient come to the emergency room with a pelvic fracture, that is just a marker for significant injury. About 6 to 10 percent of all patients with pelvic fractures will actually succumb um, because of either the pelvic fracture, hemorrhage from the pelvic fracture, or uh, associated injuries. So if you look, we've actually done a lot to actually improve the outcomes of patients with pelvic fractures. You know, in the earlier part of the century, you know, with the medical technology that we had, it was a very significant mortality uh, to have a pelvic fracture, both from the fracture itself and from the you know, attributable mortality from associated injuries. But in the last two decades or so, with the advances in tech medical technology, including uh, advances in massive transfusion strategy, most recently the damage control resuscitation strategy, uh, temporary stabilization devices, uh, the, the realization of the significance of this injury pattern and, and, the, and the realization that is, this is really a multidisciplinary uh, all the kids out of the pool type of, of uh, patient, uh, to get these patients through, this requires very significant uh, resource utilization. Now, if you look at fracture mechanism and why do patients get pelvic fracture, you can see that the large majority of, of pelvic fracture are associated with blunt mechanisms, with whether motor vehicle crashes, motor vehicle, or excuse me, motor pedestrian crashes, falls, motorcycles, and the like. If you look at mortality, the mortality associated with, with patients with pelvic fracture is substantially hemorrhaged. And that's hemorrhage from, from a number of sources. One, you can have significant hemorrhage from the pelvis, which we're going to talk about over the course of this, this uh, lecture. But also you can have he significant hemorrhage from a myriad of associated injuries. Certainly there is a tremendous amount of traumatic brain injury and neurologic injury associated with patient, in patients that have pelvic injury. And again, I have some some studies later on in the, in the, in the context of the presentation that will illustrate that. And again, by virtue of the fact that you have such a high energy mechanism, um, these patients, a lot of these patients will end up in the intensive care unit and actually may go on to uh, have multiple organ failure as a cause of their demise. Well, going to the basics, pelvis anatomy. So if you look at pelvic anatomy uh, with respect to the basic vascular and neurologic anatomy, you can see that the relationship of the pelvic brim to both the, the, excuse me, the femoral artery, the femoral vein, and the femoral nerve. You can also see that the, 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 the major arterials and venous systems lie within the posterior part of the pelvis. Uh, 
The presacral venous plexus is a sort of ill-described uh, uh, diffuse uh, venous plexus over the, por uh, the posterior or anterior aspect of the sacrum that's very rich in venous blood supply. And there is a tremendous bulk of cancellous bone, and all of these will bleed uh, if you have pelvic fracture. Now, with respect to the pelvis ligamentous anatomy, it is because the pelvis is you know, anatomic role in, in supporting axial load of the human body. There it requires a tremendous bony and ligamentous architecture to support that type of, of uh, uh, those, those force vectors. So there are uh, ex, uh, very stout uh, posterior ligaments, particularly sacrospinous ligaments, uh, which can be viewed uh, from the anterior perspective and also on the posterior perspective. And the, the pink is the, are the sacrotuberous and the green are the sacrospinous ligaments. So a really tr a very stout uh, ligamentous support for, of, the, of the pelvis anatomy. Now if you put those two together, you can see that those, those the anatomic relationships between the ligamentous support of the pelvis and the vascular, particularly the vascular supply within the pelvis, and as I, as I show you some of the slides and the radiographs in the next few slides, you'll see that sort of the intimate uh, interposition or apposition of these structures uh, leads to significant hemorrhage in patients with pelvic fracture. So when you uh, are specifically evaluating the patient with pelvic, potential pelvic injury, on physical examination, you want to do a couple things. You want to uh, apply internal compression and you want to apply some anterior palpation. The things you're looking for on physical examination are you're looking for pain, certainly, but you're also looking for any mobility. If you have any mobility, any instability in the pelvis on your physical examination, again, particularly in teaching institutions, one of the greatest things that we do is if we find a, a, an interesting uh, anatomic or physiologic uh, uh, factor in a patient, we want to show it to all the students um, this is not one of those things that you want to have every student and every resident and all the PAs rocking on the pelvis. Although it's a very interesting physical finding, you know, theoretically all that motion of the pelvis will cause uh, clot destabilization and potentiate the bleeding. There are some basic x-rays that we also get in the evaluation of the patient with, uh, with potential for pelvic fracture. The AP, fra the, the AP view, the inlet and the outlet, and a lot of the plain radiographs that we used to get are kind of, have kind of been superseded by the utilization of, of, of CT technology where we can do a lot of the CT techniques or the C, get a lot of the, the uh, x-ray visualization out of, the, out of the CT, particularly with the ability to do reconstruction that we did in the past with, uh, with uh, plain radiography. So when you look at it specifically, when, when the, and a lot of our orthos, orthopedists still like these specialty views, but when you're looking at the, these specialty views, the inlet view is basically just canting the tube, so you're looking down into the, the brim of the pelvis. The outlet view is basically 90 degrees, so you're basically looking at the ischium from a, uh, basically a direct perpendicular view. Pelvic fracture classification. Now, the pelvic fracture classification um, can be split into, and in, there are many different theories, there are many, many different stratifications. The one I, th I like, because it's very simple for the general surgeon, is the Young-Burgess classification. And the Young-Burgess classification is basically just a classification based on uh, energy and force vector. If you look uh, more uh, specifically at the Young-Burgess classification, it's classified into three basic variants, the lateral compression, so you get an impact from the side, an anterior posterior compression where your impact comes from the front, and the vertical compression where the impact comes from one of your axial directions, usually from below. Now I want to go over specifically a couple of, 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 of injury patterns, and I think these are very salient um, to, the, to the general surgeon, particularly because if you understand kind of the, the energy mechanism, uh, the force vectors, and the sort of the implied energy, uh, it'll give you an idea of how sick this patient can potentially be. So the first one thing I want to talk about is the LC1. So the LC1 is a, is a, is a relatively lower energy uh, lateral compression vector. What you see in the LC1s is you'll see these uh, uh, ramus fractures up front, and posteriorly you may see very subtle, a very subtle sacral buckle. Uh, 
Now, when we refer these, practically, when we refer these and get the, our orthopedists to consult on these in the, uh, uh, when we admit these patients, the large majority of these, the orthopedists will look at the films, look at the patients, and most of these folks will be weight-bearing as tolerated. Um, and then they will only apply any, any specific management if the patient has any instability or significant pain. Now, why is that? Well, if you look at the, the LC1s, you can see that actually the architecture of the pelvic ring is, is basically is, is retained even with that sacral buccal fracture and those anterior fractures because the posterior elements of the pelvis are still intact. However, uh, and this is what that looks like on, on a plain film. You'll see, you may see, you can see here the, the uh, anterior uh, pubic ramus fractures. And if you look at the, the view here, you can see a very subtle sacral buckle where the sacral foramina have collapsed. Now, the, the stable LC1 may also, you can see, looks like this on CT. The anterior architecture of the sacrum is, is disrupted. The unstable LC1 is a little different. So the unstable LC1, that sacral buckle has now had enough energy imparted to it that it has actually cracked all the way through the sacrum. So you, in fact, have a free-floating uh, hemipelvis. Now this actually acts like an unstable pelvic fracture. So if you have to classify stable or the pelvic fractures uh, basically on their physiology, most LC1 fractures tend to be very stable with the caveat that they can be physiologically unstable in elderly patients who have a tend more of a proclivity to bleed. Everything other than, and, and the vast majority of pelvic fractures are LC1 pelvic fractures. Anything greater or not an LC1 has the potential to be unstable both anatomically and physiologically. So the LC2 fracture is basically a, a more significant force vector. You break the iliac wing. This is what it looks like on plane films. The LC3 fracture is a very interesting fracture pattern. Uh, this is so-called windswept pelvis. So if you have a patient that's been run over, physically run over by a vehicle, or also uh, the other way to get this, the significant way to get this injury is to be pinched between two vehicles. So the trooper that's standing on the side of the road uh, giving somebody a ticket and gets pinched between by another vehicle that kind of sideswipes down that car, that's another sort of mechanism to get this type of injury. So what happens is you get an implosion on one side of the pelvis and explosion on the opposite side of the pelvis. Again, because of the, the posterior, particularly the posterior ligamentous disruption, these have a very significant tendency for hemorrhage. Now, this is just a, a, a little video clip of sort of the dynamics of that lateral compression fracture. And what I want you to be, pay attention to here is look about, identify sort of the distraction of the, or the compression of the pelvis and where it recoils. And I think that one of the important things to remember is where we see it in the emergency room on those plane films is not usually not where it was in the field. There's a tremendous amount of elastic recoil to the human body. So a lot of times these will have very significant force that's, that is applied and you can see that the, the you can see the force generated applied across the pelvis, and there's a very significant recoil. Uh, also, uh, ultimately, the, that after the recoil is what we will see in the emergency department. Now, this is a little vignette that just shows the associated injury mechanism. If I can go back there, watch what the, the you can see. The impact is also taken by the rest of the body. There's a significant distraction of the neck. And the head, particularly in these lateral impacts, there's a tremendous amount of neurologic and brain injury associated with pelvic fracture because the head tends to basically have, uh, basically either slaps the window or hits the windshield or hits the dashboard. Um, and then there's, this tr again, a tremendous amount of traumatic brain injury in patients with pelvic fracture. The anterior posterior compression, this is where your force vector comes right at you from the front. So in the AP1s, there's basically just Generally, these are not radiographically very apparent. They may have a little bit of anterior pain on palpation. Uh, this is what it looks like radiographically. The AP2s, now the AP2s, now you've opened up, this is sort of the, the so-called open book pelvis. So now you have opened up the, the pubic symphysis, and now you have torn the anterior aspect of the, of the, uh, of the iliosacral uh, ligamentous com uh, complex posteriorly. So now you have a, a, a hemipelvis that's winging open. 
And again, this is kind of what it looks like on radiographs. And what that does, once you start applying force to that posterior ligamentous and bony architecture, that's when you have problems with significant hemorrhage. Now the AP3s, again, more significant force vector. In the AP3s, you tear that hemipelvis, the posterior and anterior ligamentous uh, supports of the, of the of a hemipelvis are torn. And now again, you have a free-floating pelvis and a significant in risk for injury, or excuse me, for hemorrhage. The vertical shear, now the vertical shear is when you're the force vector, again, just a different force vector. It's applied from one of the axial directions. Usually it's applied from below. When you'll see significant vertical shear injuries are jumpers or people that have fallen from significant heights, but also you'll see it from car, car, uh, car uh, wrecks. Particularly when somebody is at the wheel, they see a, they, uh, they're trying to brake in reaction to an obstacle, your natural reaction is to push your leg down and lean your chest and your face away from the impact. So in effect, you can actually get your body almost straight up on the, on the brake um, as, 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 you, as, you, as you brake to, to brace for impact. The, uh, the issue is with this is now that force vector is applied up through that, that leg into the axial uh, uh, pelvis and you can get vertical shear injuries. So the acute management strategy. So we have a lot, there's, no, again, number of mechanisms. Actually, one of the most uh, mechanisms that we see down here in Texas that we don't see in a lot of other places in the country is uh, bull riders. We see a, a tremendous number of bull riders that actually have uh, uh, pelvic fractures. Now, what kind of fracture do you think the bull rider would get? Anybody? Yoga? Now they'd get lateral compression if he got bucked off and fell on the ground and ladder out, landed on his side. But usually that bull coming up between their legs, just like a motorcycle, will give them an AP compression. Exactly. So basically, it's very simple. ATLS paradigm, but with, specifically with respect to pelvis, we're, we're, we're worried about sort of the implied injuries with respect to hemorrhage and circulation. So on the secondary survey, you, go, you want to minimize uh, too much manipulation. It is very important in patients with pelvic fracture. Uh, you know, we've gone away from doing routine rectal exams and GYN exams on every single trauma patient. But the patient with pelvic fracture, this is absolutely incumbent upon us to do these exams. So you want to do a good rectal exam, a good vaginal exam. You want to make sure there's no blood, uh, no retained foreign body, and uh, particularly bone shards that will, can perforate the, the rectum uh, or the, or the uh, GU or, uh, or GYN systems. So the, talk a little bit about the acute management strategies, the associated injury management, and definitive pelvic stabilization, how that, that sort of plays into the, the role of the general surgeon. So you can see this really requires a multidisciplinary approach. So if you have a patient with a significant pelvic fracture, generally these are not going to be cared for out in rural or suburban America. These are all patients that are sick enough that generally require tertiary referral and are going to end up in our academic and our level one trauma centers. So the acute management, basically there's a couple of people that are very important in the acute management of the patient with a pelvic fracture. One is the trauma surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon, and in several instances your, your interventional radiologist. So the hemorrhage, hemorrhage control is really the biggest issue with pelvic fracture and the, and the things that you have to be concerned of are the control of any extra pelvic hemorrhage, again, the amount of associated injury in, in patients with pelvic fractures, the angioembolization and pelvic stabilization is, attendant, is incumbent upon the orthopedic surgeons. So why is this important? If you look at transfusion requirements, so patients with these not unstable, higher grade pelvic fractures all have a tremendous transfusion requirement. There's just a couple of studies uh, in the past uh, 10 years that are actually now 20 years, um, that have uh, illustrated the, the points that uh, that was actually my first paper. Um, but the, these have tremendous uh, proclivity uh, uh, or propensity to bleed. Some of the external pelvic hemorrhage sites include external, thoracic, abdominal, and long bone. So particularly one of the most vexing problems is the patients that have intra-abdominal injury, hemorrhage in the abdomen, and also have a pelvic fracture because then your, your issue is, is my significant hemorrhage in the abdomen or is my significant hemorrhage in the pelvis or is it both and which do I attend to first? 
So there's a couple of diagnostic modalities that we have in the emergency department that can help us make that diagnosis of intraperitoneal blood. Certainly the, the pelvic uh, hemorrhage can be uh, implied by uh, uh, pelvic fracture. Uh, with the, with uh, the, the ultrasound or DPL, we can, we can identify whether there's, there's also blood in the peritoneum. Now obviously, as just standard algorithm, a patient that's unstable with, the, with significant, what we think has significant hemorrhage, has no, uh, does not belong in the CAT scanner. So we have to identify that pelvic or that intra, that peritoneal hemorrhage in the emergency room. So why is this important? If you look at, this is a study that, that uh, I did with the guys, uh, the orthopedic guys at UT Southwestern a couple of years ago, and we looked at this specific, this specific question, is if you have bleeding in the belly and bleeding in the pelvis, you know, where's it coming from and what do you have to attend to first? So you can see that in, the, in our patients, between the stable fracture patterns, so the LC1s, and the unstable fracture patterns, basically everything else, all of them had significant amount of uh, high-grade abdominal injury. Um, there was a significant, uh, uh, there were both of, there was a significant uh, amount of hemoperitoneum in both groups. Active abdominal hemorrhage was a, a present in 40% of the unstables and 60% of the stable fracture patterns. But what's, what was very uh, uh, telling was the patients with the unstable fracture pattern, the large majority of their hemorrhage was actually coming from the pelvis. So the therapeutic dilemma really is when you have shock, hemoperitoneum, and pelvic fracture, what do you do? Where do you go first? So if you have the stable fracture pattern, this is very, very significant from, from our results. If you have a stable fracture and hemoperitoneum, your, your money is in the belly for hemorrhage. So you need to, uh, to take those patients to the operating room from expeditious laparotomy. Now if you have an unstable fracture pattern and blood in the belly, it's a much, one, one it's a much more challenging issue. Um, the hemorrhage is predominantly from pelvic fracture in our, in our study about 60% of the time. No matter what we did, whether we went to the OR first or angio first, our mortality was, was 50%. Again, that's attendant to the, the hemorrhage from the pelvis and from the associated injuries. So the, the real question is here is, is as I implied, the LC1s, you need to be in the OR. The LC2s, you go to OR first and then angio, or do you go to angio and then go to the OR? Well, our study implied that you go to angio first and go to the OR, but how practical is that? Um, we actually had a, basically an on a standby uh, angiography staff that could be there and start the angio really literally within minutes. Um, that is really probably not practical in most uh, sort of uh, environments. So I think today's, today's uh, teaching, and again, it's something that I think many level one trauma centers are evolving to, is if you have that, that scenario, you really need to be in the OR and do all of your, all of your uh, therapy in the OR. One, you can do your laparotomy in the OR, but also with, uh, particularly with uh, uh, fluoro resources, and an angio resources in the OR, you can actually do both procedures at once. Now again, there's some implications there with respect to multiple team approach versus staged approach. Do you do them at the same time? Do you do them um, in, a, in a serial manner? And certainly I think there's some surgical training implications too, that, that if we're gonna start managing these all as, as exclusively as general surgeons, then we need to have more uh, protect, perhaps endovascular uh, facility with respect to simple uh, angiography and embolization. Now why can't we just lap them and, and then go on and do the angio later? Well you can't lap somebody with a big pelvic hematoma with impunity. Um, it's been shown in numerous uh, cadaveric series that if you, once you open the belly and you split the fascia, uh, you lose a significant amount of uh, peritoneal uh, and pelvic domain. So you can have a tremendous increase in your pelvic volume just by, just as a consequence of your laparotomy. So some of the things you can do, we can do to, to temporarily, to, with respect to therapy in these is casualties, is temporary stabilization. One is, uh, particularly in the sort of resource-constrained environments, we can use a, just a simple bed sheet and wrap around the pelvis. 
One of the other things that we can use, and you know, various orthopedists like and dislike this, is basically a corset or a girdle. You center this not on the iliac wings. You center this uh, on the greater trochanters, and basically you use the force of the trochanter forcing into the acetabular cups to push the pelvis together. And this is, you know, obviously this is the good picture of how it works. Um, you can actually, particularly the AP type fractures where you have some retained ligamentous architecture posteriorly, you can actually push that pelvis together and have some tamponade effect from, from uh, using this type of technique. One of the other techniques we can use is external fixation. This is an orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon technique. This is where you apply two to three pins in each iliac wing and apply a bar between the two to temporarily or definitively stabilize the pelvis. And again, the, the thought here is the external, the external fixator basically stabilizes the pelvic volume. The advantage of the external fixator, again, it's, it can be expeditiously applied. It's important that if we have our orthopedic colleagues are going to put an external fixator on. Again, we have to impart to them the gravity of the situation, that this is active hemorrhage, and that they need to be as expeditious as possible. But generally, a trained orthopedist can do this fairly quickly. It will stabilize the pelvic volume. And by still stabilizing the pelvic volume, the thought is that we will have at least venous tamponade. Some of the disadvantages of external fixation, it may limit our definitive therapy approaches with respect to uh, orthopedic uh, uh, management. There's certainly a, a, a risk of pin site infection. It doesn't control arterial hemorrhage. So again, with a lot of these stabilizing techniques, it's important to remember that some of these, these pelvic volume control techniques are very useful to control venous hemorrhage but none of them will control arterial hemorrhage. So if, you, if you're able to stabilize the pelvic volume uh, either with a fixator or a sheet or one of these corset devices, if the patient's still having hemorrhage issues, then it's very important to, to actually go to the next step to control that arterial volume, which is either going to be uh, probably best done with our invasive radiologists or can even be done surgically. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So again, next step, angioembolization. So, uh, the angioembolization is a catheter-based technique. Our invasive, ra technique, our invasive radiologist can put a catheter in the iliofemoral system, can do an angiogram, identify the sources of bleeding, and then do angioembolization. Okay? It's important that if we have a patient with significant hemorrhage um, from these pelvic fractures, that we get our invasive radiologists, our radiology colleagues involved as soon as possible. Uh, even on our way to the OR. I mean, if we, you'll have a gestalt if the patient is that sick from a pelvic fracture that they're going to need angiography, call them on your way to the OR so that you can do your damage control celiotomy and then be ready to have the patient, done, have, have the, be ready to have the patient either in the angio suite or have an angio done in the operating room immediately after you finished your procedure. So if you look at the outcomes from angioembolization, there's several good studies. But these studies would uh, imply that uh, uh, there is a significant, again, because there, there is uh, there's significant hemorrhage, there is significant mortality, but it's not related to the, to the, to the angioembolization. But angioembolization is, is able to identify uh, uh, sources of bleeding and control those sources of bleeding in, in the large majority of patients, and that's been shown in numerous studies over the years. One of the things that's actually become uh, sort of relatively newer on the forefront is preperitoneal pelvic packing. Now, preperitoneal pelvic packing is not a new technique. It was actually popularized in Europe uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, particularly by the group at Hanover. Um, they used uh, the they either did a fan and steel or a lower midline approach, stayed extra peritoneal, packed. Uh, the, in the, in the presacral venous plexus, packed the preperitoneal space, and were able to have pretty good results. Now, in the last five years or so, that, that technique has sort of evolved, and uh, we've been seeing some of that sort of on this side of the Atlantic. The group at Denver has actually shown very good results with pelvic packing um, and has, has published those results. There are other uh, trauma groups across the country that have, uh, that have tried the pelvic packing their results are not been as good as the group at Denver, but a lot of that has to do just with 
uh, technical issues, uh, facility and resource issues. But I think that it's one of those things that we should be familiar with is how to approach that patient, uh, different therapies to approach that patient uh, with pelvic hemorrhage. Certainly, preperitoneal packing is, not, again, not going to be able to tamponade that patient or control hemorrhage in the patient with significant arterial hemorrhage. But it is another useful therapeutic uh, tool in our armamentarium, particularly to control venous hemorrhage with tamponade. Again, if you have a patient that, through one of these techniques, continues to have physiologic instability, you need to control their arterial hemorrhage and either readdress their venous hemorrhage or go to angio for uh, at least a look at their arterial system and potential angioembolization. So associated injury management is also very significant. Again, a very significant number of these patients are going to have associated non-pelvic fracture type of, of injury. Their associated injury is correlated with fracture severity, so the worse your fracture pattern, again, higher energy imparted to the body as a whole and greater degree of associated injury. And that, again, that's been shown in numerous series. So again, this is a series uh, of associated injury. Uh, it's been, these are a couple of different series show that the 50% the of patients with pelvic fracture have traumatic brain injury, 20% have thoracic injury, and almost 50% have some sort of associated abdominal injury. When you're looking specifically at pelvic fracture uh, in the pedestrian, so a relatively unprotected mechanism, if you have an unprotected mechanism, uh, falls, pedestrians, then your rate of neurologic injury is, again, very substantial um, because of uh, the force vector applied not only to the pelvis but also to the unprotected head. So, again, this is just a little uh, video, and I want you to watch the pelvis, particularly, but after, after you see the impact of the pelvis, watch what the, the rest of the body does and particularly watch what the, what the head does. So again, the head actually has a, there's a, a different dynamic effect on the neck and the head because the neck and the head is effect, effectively, it's the tip of the whip. It's like cracking the whip. So there's a tremendous whiplash effect of the neck and the, and the head either on the, on the, on the uh, hood of the car or on the, on the windshield of the car. So particularly with tel excuse me, pedestrian fractures, pedestrians with pelvic fracture have a tremendous association uh, with traumatic brain injury for this reason. Urologic injury is also substantial. As you could see in both of the sort of video clips I played, there's a tremendous uh, pelvic uh, distraction uh, and recoil. So many times those bony uh, components will go across the midline of the pelvis now, in the, in the midline of the pelvis, we have our urologic organs, our gynecologic organs, uh, and our lower uh, uh, aerodigestive tract. So all of those can be injured as those bony uh, shards traverse the pelvis. So the first thing I want to talk about is urologic injury. About 10, excuse me, about 15 to 20 percent of patients with pelvic fracture, particularly the more unstable pelvic fractures, will have associated urologic injury. They can be extraperitoneal, and extraperitoneal uh, bladder injury can be dealt with mostly just supportively with, with bladder decompression. Most of the time, the bladder will heal. More substantial, if they have an intraperitoneal bladder rupture, all of those are actually going to require operative therapy for fixation. About 5% of patients with pelvic fracture are going to have urethral disruptions. Now, urethral disruptions are a very significant cause uh, of, uh, of latent morbidity in patients with uh, pelvic fracture. What our goal should be, again, our first goal is going to be obviously hemorrhage control, contamination control, but we should try to control some of the urologic injury to the best we can, uh, particularly in the acute setting by at least getting a catheter across the urethra to act as a stent. If you can get a catheter across the urethra to act as a stent, uh, that uh, can actually at least You'll have some scarring, but that can be dilated. If you have a patient that actually is going to require uh, a delayed surgery for urethral repair, they have a tremendous amount of morbidity associated with that repair. So if you look at the urologic injury and you look at repair versus just primary catheter and stenting, 
The patients with delayed repair had a much higher incidence of stricture, a much, uh, well, actually had the same incidence of, of incontinence, but also had, both had a significant, and both had a significant incidence of impotence. But, but the, so the real key there is they're gonna have a tremendous uh, problem with urethral stricture and all the complications of urethral stricture. Gynecologic injury, very much the same. You can have bony shards that will traverse the midline, injure the vagina, injure the uterus. Uh, so it's very uh, important that we do those physical, those, the, apply those physical examination techniques as the patients, uh, as we admit those patients to the emergency room. Generally, patients that have particularly vaginal lacerations can be treated uh, is with simple repair, frankly, in most cases. Just, but it's important to, that we know we have the vaginal laceration, we know that we've had violation of the pelvic viscera so that we can be attuned for any problems with it, uh, potential evolution of pelvic sepsis. Open pelvic fractures, this is sort of even higher grade injury where we have uh, significant pelvic fracture but we, now we have violation of the pelvis and violation of the perineum. And actually, we're seeing a lot of these in the, in the war right now, particularly with guys stepping on on, uh, on improvised explosive devices. So we're having a lot of amputations with these open types of pelvic fractures. So again, you have a patient. This is one of those things that you can often get distracted. These are very uh, morbid injuries. You just have to say, follow the same basic paradigm. The first thing you have to do is hemorrhage control. One of the things that makes hemorrhage control in these patients very complex is that it's very difficult to tampon on somebody with an open pelvis. So you have to either pack, temporary, temporarily close the pelvis, just so you can get some tamponade effect. Again, a lot of these patients with the open pelvis will have uh, associated visceral injury that requires uh, uh, contamination control. And again, they are associated with higher grade pelvic uh, fractures that often require stabilization. Again, the per perineal tear makes tamponade, uh, tamp compromises your tamponade, and actually causes, basically, it's, it makes your, your, your problem much more challenging and complex. So when you look at what do we do with patients with the open pelvis? Well, this was looked at by uh, uh, Dr. Mullins and Trunke and Farringer back in the 90s. And basically, it has to do with sort of the, the zone of, of injury and how far you are, frankly, away from the open area and how far you weigh away from the, the, the rectum. Um, and you can look at it both anteriorly and posteriorly. And what they found that in the patients with the zone one, because of the proximity to the, to the, to the rectum, um, they, they diverted the large majority of these patients and still had a 26% sepsis rate. The patients with zone two, they were more selective about diverting and had, uh, again, because of the, it was away from the, the zone of contamination, had less wound sepsis. And as you get out into the, into the flanks and out into the lateral hips, away from, again, areas of, of significant contamination, probably don't need to be diverted. And, and most of the time, those patients will not develop wound sepsis. Definitive stabilization requires an orthopedic surgeon. They can do, there's a number of techniques they can apply uh, to, to, fix the, to, to fix the pelvis. And I think it's important for us because, we're, again, we're not going to be doing this stabilization. But we need to know what our orthopedic colleagues are going to be doing in their stabilization and what types of problems they can actually bring upon us and, and the, as a general surgeon uh, with respect to complications. So again, with respect to orthopedic uh, fixation, again, requires, most of these will require multiple surgeons. Uh, fluoroscopy requires special tables. Um, it's important that as, as we're doing, working up these patients to, you know, be uh, involved with our orthopedic colleagues. So enteric contrast is going to affect the way they do their stabilization. If we put in a super pubic tube, that's going to affect their stabilization. So again, we need to work as a team, particularly with our orthopedic surgeons, to make sure that we optimize the care of these patients with pelvic fractures. So again, this is basically the, the, the orthopedic algorithm, very basically on what they do. The patients with lateral compression ones and AP ones have very conservative management. Again, they're the non, you know, the weight bearer is tolerated. The AP twos, because they have posterior ligamentous architecture, all they really need to do is close the book. 
So they bring the book closed in the front, and they can put a simple plate along the prebix symphysis, and that's basically all it requires. Now, the patients with higher grade LC2s, LC3s, AP3s, they're usually going to require both anterior and posterior fixation. So why is that important? Um, some of their therapeutic goals, including minimize p uh, uh, pelvic hemorrhage, improve mobility, excuse me, improve mobility, because as they improve mobility, you know, they're going to de we're going to decrease the incidence of pneumonia, decrease the incidence of deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and the like. And also, they're actually putting these, you know, five or six inch long screws across the pelvis, and they need to sort of minimize the risk of iatrogenic injury. But we also have to be aware of those issues because we may have to deal with, for instance, a screw that gets into the, the retroperitoneal vascular system or a, a, a screw that gets into the, to the viscera. So these are, this is just a radiograph of an of a anterior and posterior repair. Again, you can see the size of some of those uh, posterior constructs they put in. Some of the complications that are associated with patients with pelvic fracture, uh, certainly deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism for a number of reasons. One, patients with this degree of, of trauma are all hypercoagulable, but also you, you put on to it that a lot of these patients have associated injury. A lot of these patients have the degree of pelvic injury. They'll have uh, sort of uh, genesis of clot just within the pelvic venous system. So they have a tremendously high potential uh, for deep venous thrombosis. So again, uh, uh, DVT prophylaxis is very important in these patients when it is appropriate. Obviously, you can't do it in a patient that's actively hemorrhaging. So if you have a patient and you have significant hemorrhage concerns, um, these are patients, these are one of the types of patients that actually may benefit from having a prophylactic vena cava filter. And again, as you would imagine, because of the degree of pelvic disruption, particularly in the sacrum, these patients all potentially have uh, neurologic complications. So if you look at DVT and pulmonary embolus, if, if you have no prophylaxis, your incidence of deep venous thrombosis in trauma patients is about 40%. If you prophylax patients, you're, you greatly diminish your rate of DVT and pulmonary embolus. Um, also, as I, as I mentioned, that uh, many of these thrombi will actually generate in the, in the pelvic veins, um, and so DVT prophylaxis is very important. Neurologic uh, function, you can see that as you go up in grade, tile is, a, is another anatomic classification very similar to young Burgess. Um, but as you go up in anatomic grade, you can see that patients with uh, sort of moderate uh, anatomic severity injury had a neurologic deficit of 20%. And if you go up to higher grade uh, anatomic variants, their degree of neurologic injury goes up to 60%. So if you look at outcomes in patients with pelvic fracture, this is a study done by Brenneman uh, in, in 97, showed that if you just looked at quality of life, so again, a lot of times in trauma research, we just looked at simple outcomes like you know live, die. But uh, if you look at quality of life, there's a sort of increased emphasis on other uh, attributes, outcome attributes, other than just lived and died. If you look at quality of life, the patients with pelvic fractures have a significant detriment in their quality of life, both in their general health, their vitality, you know, being able to get around, social functioning, uh, their emotional health, and their mental health. And you can see how all those sort of interplay uh, uh, together um, and how a patient with significant injury, and this probably applies to many different severe injury patterns, they have significant alterations in just their simple activities of daily living that can really alter their quality of life. Um, so if you look at patients with the open pelvis and closed, uh, open fractures and closed fractures, uh, that, uh, that number even becomes uh, you know, more striking. You can see that, uh, again, the, the, these patients have chronic pain. They have chronic physical disability. Um, so again, patients with these high-grade injuries have very significant long-term uh, dysfunction. Now, specifically, outcomes in, in, in particularly uh, uh, gravid or potentially gravid females, uh, the, the, there's a significant issue with uh, sexual dysfunction. Um, this was a study done by Carol Copeland, uh, one of my colleagues uh, at uh, Shock Trauma that women generally felt that there was some, obviously some mental health issues associated with the long-term outcomes, uh, but also, you know, because of their, 
chronic pain, dyspareunia. Uh, they had significant decrease in their, you know, their, their uh, sexual virility. Um, and also because of, particularly with uh, pelvic stabilization techniques and closing the pelvis, um, it doesn't allow for that, you know, that ligamentous laxity associated with pregnancy. So the large majority of these uh, uh, patients that had pelvic fracture requiring particularly anterior stabilization also will, if they did get pregnant, actually <coughs> required C-section to have a successful uh, or to actually minimize the complications around the birth. So in conclusion, it's very important as general surgeons that we recognize that pelvic fractures are, you know, they're bad in and of themselves, uh, but they are a marker for very significant uh, injury to other regions of the body. Um, there's a significant association between the type of fracture, the severity of fracture, uh, and associated injuries. Uh, we want to apply the sort of the, you know, the basics in terms of our ma management priorities, and really the 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 take-home message for, for, for this uh, presentation. And these patients with pelvic fractures require a tremendous amount of resources, and it's very incumbent upon us to work as a team uh, as the general surgeons leading the ship, but it's very imp important that we work as a team with our or the orthopedists, urologists, invasive radiologists, and like to optimize the outcomes of these patients. So with that, I'll close and be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one thing that I think maybe the, a lot of us could, could benefit from hearing, uh, and, and for the medical students, the, the challenge here in the pelvic fracture patient who also needs a laparotomy is that the hematoma comes up to the semilunar line just below the umbilicus. And so when you do your trauma laps on patients with pelvic fractures, do you make your incision above that intentionally and stay out of the pelvic hematoma? Or do you get into it and then put your packing preperitoneal because now you're in that preperitoneal space? Or do you ever just pack intraperitoneal and pack down the hematoma that way, or is that not worth doing? And, and I can tell you what I do, but there is actually no good literature on that. Um, I actually do a full laparotomy, and then I will pack, if I have a patient with a big pelvic hematoma, um, I will pack down in the preperitoneal space. So take my packs and put them in the space of Ritzius and down around into the, into the you know, presacral plane. Um, but again, there's no good answer. And I think that's really probably really the, one of the most, and it's still an unanswered question, you know, how do we optimize the care of the patient that has bleeding in their belly that needs a laparotomy or we think may need a laparotomy? And the patient also control the the, help, the hemorrhage in the pelvis. Um, and I recently reviewed a, uh, a study uh, for the Journal of Trauma from Miami that that showed pretty convincing evidence that actually the maybe, again this is in a this is in a big level one trauma center that has a tremendous amount of resources. But they took patients to the operating room, lapped them and then actually did their sort of angiography sort of at that time or directly after um, and actually found that their, their mortality outcomes were better by doing it laparotomy angio versus going angio and then doing laparotomy. One of your earlier slides had DPL on. You still use it or, you know, because it was always, we were warned that that was, you get a false positive just because of the pelvic hematoma that Dent was talking about. Yeah, and, and I, I actually do use DPL, and I think that as long as you, if, if in the patient with uh, the pelvic fracture, I think you have to be, um, you have to understand where that, as, as Dan said, where that pelvic hematoma is coming from, how high it's going to go, and I will stay super umbilical in the patient. With, but I actually, I will rely on the FAST unless the FAST tells me it's negative, and I, I you know, particularly in the unstable patient, I will often go to a DPL if my, if my ultrasound is negative, just to verify whether there's bleeding in the abdomen or not. Dr. Cornet. So in answering Dr. Dent's question, you kind of identified where it may be best to be in a patient with combined abdominal and pelvic hemorrhage. But to me, another dilemma is the patient that appears to have an isolated uh, pelvic fracture that's unstable is it better to stay, in, in, in your opinion, and what does literature show, with regard to, is it better to stay in the emergency department and wait for your angiographers to arrive, 
recognizing that uh, uh, you're going to manage this definitively with angioembolization, or is it better to go to the operating room, kind of take your chances, uh, knowing that you're not going to definitively uh, manage the hemorrhage there and wait for your angiographers to arrive? You know, Mike, I don't, I don't know that there's a good answer to that, but I would say that that's probably the question that, you know, Clay Cawthorn and the folks at Denver and some of the other folks are trying to deal with, is you, have, you don't have an issue in the true peritoneum. So while you're waiting for angiography, they go to the operating room and do a lower midline or a fan and steel and pack the pelvis to control the venous hemorrhage. Because a numer a numerous um, uh, ME studies... Um, and our gestalt is that the 85% of this bleeding is actually venous bleeding. Um, so they will go to the operating room to pack the pelvis to control the venous hemorrhage, which, as you know, the, the angiogram isn't going to do anything for that while they're waiting for the angiographers to come in. But I don't know that we, we have a right answer. Do we have the capability here of having and they, they can't do it in the operating room, right? You're talking about laparotomy, celiotomy until they come and then take the patient to the angio suite? I don't think realistically they, they can. I mean, we have angio capability in room nine, but uh, they... It doesn't work. Uh, they, uh, I, I've never seen them do a combined procedure with us. Stuart? So, Brian, that was an excellent talk. The, the, so, Tile, Burgess, Trunky, you know, the, the first or the sort of mid part of your introduction, you talked about the classifications and you know, they, they have a, I mean, they get a lot of academic mileage from those classifications, which I think in general, though, are confusing to, it's confusing to me, so I would guess it's probably confusing to the residents. It's probably confusing to the people who are practicing. And in spite of a, a great description, it's still unclear to me whenever I look at it, whether that's an LC or an AP or a vertical shear, and probably usually there's some combination of mechanisms in the real world. So, so if I were to list, if whenever I listen to you, it seems like to me you summarize it very well, but I think the message is simpler than that, if, and if you see if you agree with this, is if Choice. the, if the <laughs> Remember that contract you were talking about? <laughs> the contract is still floating out there. <laughs> If the, if the posterior elements of the pelvis are significantly disrupted, that's, a, that's usually an unstable pelvic fracture, a great risk for bleeding from the pelvis. That's the way I look at it. Whereas if the posterior elements are intact and you have a ramus fracture or bilateral ramus fracture or an acetabular fracture, it seems like to me that th those patients mostly are stable. And then did you get the Trunkey's article, that's also generally confusing. If the perineum and perianal region are involved, those are patients with a great risk of pelvic sepsis and need to be diverted. All true. So you, you right. agree with that? Yeah, so, and I think that's, that's a very good point. And, and the, the reason I chose to actually the, the young, young Burgess is because in my mind, it's very simple. It's, it's simple lateral, thing. anterior, or vertical shear. When you get into Buholtz and Tile, they're much more complex. Oh, I, I, but, but if you want, I, I would agree with you, uh, Dr. Stewart, that if you simplify it, if one, if you can see that you have a hemi pelvis that's distracted, that's an unstable pelvis. Okay. Some of the things that'll tip you off to that is look at those posterior, look at the SI joints, um, and that's actually if they're if it's readily apparent. If the if, you know if the third or third year or fourth year medical student can see it, that's one that you know it's 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 not subtle and is probably going to need you know hemorrhage control and the like. The other thing that can tip you off to that is a patient that has opening of their pubic symphysis, opening of the pubis, pubic symphysis at least op, opening of the pubic symphysis at least implies distraction of the anterior architecture of the of the of the sacroiliac joint. So those are also patients. So I, again, I think that that is absolutely, absolutely true. And then when you get into patients with open pelvic fractures, right, if it's around a contaminated orifice, they have the highest proclivity for, for pelvic sepsis, and those are the ones you should probably entertain diverting. Dr. Stewart, in your trauma prevention, has the way they make cars now made a difference? Uh, with that, uh, for those of us who have experienced that standing position on the brakes uh, at 70 plus miles an hour, uh, 
not quite. <laughs> not exactly Dale Earnhardt, but uh, is that different now with the unibody construction and where the engine is designed to drop down and not come back at you? Yes. So. Actually, Andy Burgess is who's uh, actually one of my mentors. I actually entertained the thought of being an orthopedist once in my life. Um, but Andy has worked with uh, NHTSA quite extensively, and uh, through work of the ortho, particularly the orthopedic community, have uh, developed uh, changes in the uh, vehicle architecture that actually make it safer for all, not only for the pelvis, but for all regions of the body. So one is the way that the the unibody construction also. Um, Airbags, even not just the, but particularly the side impact airbags, where you saw that one schematic where the head sort of flops over and hits the hits the window. Um, they have been tremendously effective at decreasing traumatic brain injury in patients with uh, with uh, with side impacts. They're also now experimenting with an external airbag. So if the if the if the uh, Hit a hit a patient hit a patient. Well, I guess if you hit them, they're a patient. But if you hit somebody in the with the with the front of your car, you actually have an airbag that sort of deploys up your windshield, that so that their head will strike the airbag and not the windshield. So there's lots of kind of neat G whiz things that the auto yes. industry is Could doing. Could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Julian De Serpo. I'm a fourth year from a and I'm visiting. Here you are. <laughs> And I just have a question about the uh, preperitoneal packing. You said that it has variable results, so I was just wondering if there's any indication for not doing it. Well, most of us don't do it. So uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a procedure that not many people have facility with. Um, and it's so, it's, you know, so few uh, surgeons in the United States use it that it really hasn't sort of gotten sort of the critical surgical acclaim to be uh, ubiquitously used. So I've, o I've only done it, I, frankly, I've done it a few times, but I've done it in environments in the desert where I didn't have anything else. If you're there, you really don't want to be there, right. and you don't want to ever be there again. Yeah. Correct. John or Ronnie, have you guys ever used it? No, but, but it, is, it is, of course, attractive. I think the reason why you, exactly why you, the reason you gave for the Denver General people gets to Mike's question of, in, this, in the patient we're having to decide, is this in the abdomen, is this pelvic bleeding, then getting to the operating room and doing something is, makes, makes a lot of sense. And to me, whether you're doing pelvic packing or extra peritoneal packing, <laughs> I, I think it's probably better if you're uncertain to go do something and call your angiographers not, not when you finish the operation. On your way up. On your way to the OR. If you do that, I think that makes that, that makes logical sense. The only thing I would I would our orthopedic surgeons it was a great great talk description of all the techniques. One of the things they ask us to do is when we're doing either if we do that approach or if we do a midline laparotomy, if the if there's any chance they might have to plate across the symphysis. They ask us not to do our usual true stem to stern. They ask us to try to spare that skin on the, on the pelvis. And if we have to do an ostomy, they make a big deal about trying to work with them first to decide where they're going to, where they're going to put their either posterior fixation or pins so we place the ostomy in a favorable location to them. Right. And so that was sort of portends the, the comments I made about the, the suprapubic tube and the visceral contrast, all those things. It's really we need to work with our ortho, particular orthopedic colleagues so that we don't screw up their uh, their approaches. But to answer your question, I think we'll see a lot more of it in the in the future. But right now, it's just sort of a an evolving technique in the states. So blood at the meatus, you're still going to do a retrograde, right? Prior, even though you're worried about strictures, you still want to know that ahead of time. That comes up on right. board questions all the time. So again, high incidence of urethral injury. Uh, so again, be looking for the clinical stigmata, and if they have the clinical stigmata, uh, the blood ethmiatus, um, you know, the high riding prostate, then you want to do a retrograde urethrogram before you put a Foley in. Um, and if you end up in the operating room with a ruptured bladder or or the like, and you know, and you and you have a disrupted urethra, again, get your urologist involved early because there's some you know neat little tricks they can do with cysto and magnets. To get you know to get a catheter across that urethra again, 
decrease their, their long-term complications with, with uh, particular stricture. Has the trauma surgeons uh, retracted or redacted all of Norm McSwain's uh, mass trousers? Yes, 100%. They're gone. They don't exist anymore. Well, they no. exist, um, uh, and I think that you know the the only area that some would suggest uh, uh, would be in sort of temporary pelvic stabilization. Um, but for the large part, mass trousers have gone away. And even you know you know the, they used the to old be in the ambulance, uh, even the advocates the like you know Ken Maddox and Norm McSwain actually sort of sort of say they're pretty much contraindicated now. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. All right, thank you very much.